So what is a woman? And today I'm discussing that question. Actually, we're doing a movie review. Is it a movie? I mean, what, is it a movie or is it a documentary? What do you even call this thing? It's a recent sh movie that came that out. It's definitely a documentary. Yeah. Documentary for sure. Probably but is also it a movie? A movie. <laughs> Probably also a movie. It's, it's a moving picture. Yeah. A, a moving picture by Matt Walsh. And he's developed this, uh, this really long documentary on this very... But it sounds like a very simple question. What is a woman? And today that's what we're doing on the show is we're reviewing this documentary, which um, it was, it elicited some emotions for me. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to, to be so emotionally moved by this moving picture, but it was, I, I thought it was very interesting. Obviously, like, I mean, I guess we can just jump right in. Well, let me let me talk about my guest a little bit first, uh, Dr. Thomas Bogardis. He's been on the channel a few times. He's a philosopher of gender, so he's written and published on the topic of gender in philosophy. And he's, uh, like I said, he's been on the show a few times to talk about a bunch of different subjects. He's one of my favorite guests. But uh, let me let me pass it over to you before we get into the actual like back and forth about the movie and, and our actual movie review because we both have a lot of thoughts on this. Why don't I just let you kind of uh, introduce yourself to the audience for those that might just be familiarizing themselves with you for the first time. All right. Um, well, I'm an associate professor of philosophy, and I guess my background is mostly in metaphysics and epistemology. But I guess around the year 2016, I did start doing some research in philosophy of gender, and I started writing um, a few years after that. And I've published one popular level work in a... Um, two um two papers in journals on this issue and then one actually another paper just came out yesterday um it's called why the trans inclusion problem cannot be solved and um, you can find that on my website if you go to my website so yeah that one that paper just dropped yesterday um but i guess i would just list philosophy of gender as an area of competence but i, I don't really consider that an area of specialization but anyway that's a little bit about me um Shall we talk about the Matt Walsh documentary? We should at some point. Yeah. So I uh, think you, the way these reviews go is usually you like sandwich criticisms with <laughs> like nice things. Um, you say some nice things about the work um, and then you put some criticisms in there. So maybe we should start with some um, some of the things some we nice particularly things. liked. Yeah. Okay. So I, I thought it was, um, you know, it was funny in parts and it was obviously well produced. And um, I thought that Walsh did a pretty good job of showing how insecure and shallow a lot of contemporary gender ideology is for many people. Um, I mean, all he had to do was just ask a few challenging questions, a few um, somewhat skeptical questions, and um, a lot of his interviewees got pretty flustered and confused. Um, I guess something else I'd say is I've, I've listened to some of his podcasts and I think he pretty regularly says he, he didn't go to college. I mean, that's something he, he advertises and talks about a bit. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's right. But I think he's got a, he's got a good head on his shoulders. Um, he's developed a lot of common sense and um, critical thinking abilities throughout his life. He's, he's asking the right questions. He's asking good questions. Um, so he's not always very careful about thinking through the, the nitty gritty details of the answers. I, I think he is asking important questions. And so although something... he has no, he has no formal Sorry. training in philosophy. That's not, this is the last thing I'll say. He's got no, I guess as far as I know, he has no formal training in philosophy. But he sort of thinks like like a proto philosopher. Um, I think had he decided to pursue philosophy, he would have taken to it naturally. Yeah, I was, I was going to say on on the positive side of things, I I do think that he was very quick on his feet. So like there were certain points during his interviews when he. I mean, if I was in his position, I would have like struggled to come up with a good question or like a follow up. And I mean, some of the people, some of the interviewees that he was talking to were they, they were taking the way that he was responding in a negative light. They were like, oh, well, this means like, why are you even asking that question? That was one of the things that one of the mm -hmm. uh, I think the gender professor, uh, I've, I've got his name written down. Let me actually pull it up real quickly because he was actually one of my favorite interviews. Patrick uh, Grzanka. Dr. Patrick Grzanka is gender studies professor. And he, he was like, well, why are you even asking that question? Like, why is that your follow-up? You know? And that was kind of like yeah. one of his, his responses that he made a couple times actually during their interview. But I, I thought to say something 
really nice about Matt. I, I thought that he was able to really quickly think on his feet and provide some really good follow up questions. He's like, well, what yeah. is truth? And then he's like, oh, well, it's the same truth that, you know, we're, we're sitting in this room. So he, he had obviously like had prepared responses to some of the questions that he thought he might get in return. So I, that's, I, I would say one, one really nice thing. Now on, on the topic of like the cinematography, I've seen a lot of people say that the cinematography and stuff, like the way that everything looks was really nice. But as a photographer, it's like middle of the line to me. Like the audio at certain points was like really off. And that's something that I noticed. So like at some points it was a lot louder. At some points it was a lot softer. At some points it just sounded muffled. And uh, I'm listening on some really nice like studio monitors. So I could tell the difference as I'm like watching the the documentary on like how things sound. Uh, yeah. And like when they were outside, the audio wasn't that great. Um, I just I just watched it on my phone. So I think I totally missed it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I remember yeah, when well, Avatar I came the, uh, out. I, uh, when Avatar came out, like way back in the day, um, I met a huge fan fanboy of Avatar, and I told them that I watched the movie on my phone, and they um, I thought they were going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just think that like it was okay. Like the cinematography was was all right. Like it could have been a lot cooler. It could have been a lot better. I think that they. I think maybe their budget was was fairly small for this in relation to like the types of documentaries that are regularly produced. I, I don't know who their, their uh, director of photography was, but it, it just, it seemed okay to me. And I, I, and maybe I'm like really alone in, in that thought, but as a photographer, some, someone with that background, it just, it was all right. So why, do, is there anything else that you'd like to say positive before we move into uh, some of our criticisms or just uh, some, some general thoughts about the documentary? Well, yeah, here's a, here's a little segue. Um, it's sort of positive, sort of negative. I think that this was, a, it was somewhat an exercise in preaching to the choir or sort of rallying the yeah. base. And I, I suppose there's a place for that. Um, and I think here's, here's the upside. For some people, it might serve as a way into these sorts of discussions, a way into these issues could be a useful introduction to the main issues in this debate. Um, but I thought what we could do is um, provide what might be a useful supplement for some people who are just getting into this debate. Maybe they watched the documentary. Um, I think we could give them some more information, fill out some of the details that the documentary leaves untouched. Um, so maybe and by we, we mean you. Those. Okay. You mean Because <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I've got my own questions about the the topics that they covered and stuff. Because this is, I think, it's a very complicated issue, and I'm not saying that like this documentary has like settled it in my mind of like what the view, the correct view is supposed to be. And I don't think that anyone watching should really come away with that view either. I think that, as you said, that things like there's a lot more to be said on yeah. sort of both sides of this, and maybe we can get into some of that stuff. So. Yeah, Where I guess should it's we sort begin? of like the way, you know, there's some philosophical movies like The Matrix or Inception or Tenet or whatever that get some people excited about philosophy and get them in the door. Um, maybe this documentary could play that role. Um, and I was just on your channel a few weeks ago and we were talking about this very same issue. So I'm going to try not to cover a lot of the same territory. I'm going to try to front load some new, some, some new material. Um, one thing I noticed while I was watching a documentary is that... Um, a few times Matt Walsh encountered this sort of objection um, when he asked people, what, what is a woman? Some people responded that only women can say what a woman is. So it might be inappropriate for um, Matt Walsh to even be talking about this issue. And some interviewees suggested it would be, you know, out of bounds or out of, it's not their place to say what a woman is. The first therapist he talked to said, I'm not a woman, so I can't answer that. Um, one of the people, a man on the street that Walsh interviewed, when Walsh asked him what's a woman, this man said, that's a project for those who identify as women. Another street interviewee says, why are you asking a gay man what it is to be a woman? You should ask a woman. And later in that same response, he said, where does a guy get the right to say what a woman is? Uh, women only know what women are. I think he meant to say only women know what women are, but that's the idea. Um, and so I think what's being expressed here is um, some something in the neighborhood of what philosophers would call standpoint epistemology. <clears throat> like in order to have 
um, an educated opinion or in order to have the right sort of access to the answer to a question, you've got to occupy a certain position. You have to, you have, to have a certain kind of standpoint. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people, when they preface their remarks in public, they often start by citing their position. They say like, as a pediatrician or as a gay man or something like that. They'll like, they sort of start with their standpoint, with their position. And they say like, this the idea is this gives me standing to speak on this topic. And um, I myself am a little, I'm skeptical of standpoint epistemology. I think that our education system is letting people down in a way and they're sort of passing this as passing this off as critical thinking. Some people think this is just what it is to think critically about a topic, to sort of evaluate who's talking and whether they check the right boxes to have an informed opinion on the topic. And if they don't check the right boxes, then you can dismiss what they're saying. So as I said, I'm a bit skeptical of that. Um, Matt Walsh, I, I think to his credit, he, he gives a kind of counterexample to the person who says um, only women can know what women are. He, he says, do you know what a cat is? <laughs> well, and he first asks, are, are you a cat? So he gets that answer yeah, first. Okay. He's are like, you are you a cat? Right. And they say no. Yeah. Yeah. And so obviously this is a problem. If you think like only women can know what women are, then I guess consistently you should probably think only cats can really know what a cat is. Um, but most of us feel like we are in a position to know what a cat is. Um, so I thought that was a pretty good response and it does challenge that kind of standpoint epistemology presupposition directly. Um, but, uh, it may turn people off. It kind of, it seemed a little combative or overly philosophical. And in fact, the person that Walsh was talking to says it's time, the end time to end the interview after that. So here's yeah. another option, which. Um, is a little less direct. So, you know, that's, that's sort of a con. Or less combative. It, yeah, less combative. Um, but it may be more rhetorically effective. I think if you just switch, instead of asking, what's a woman? If, they, if people object to answering that because they say, I'm not a woman, how could I know? Then just switch and say, are you a man? And if they say yes, then say, okay, what's a man? Um, and now, I mean, if Matt Walsh had decided to engage in that conversation, he would have had standing by the lights of these people who are sort of under the influence of standpoint epistemology and the mm -hmm. interviewees who were men would have had standing and the debate proceeds in basically the same way. Um, the landscape of the views is basically the same. Uh, the objections the, and the arguments are the same. You can have basically the same conversation, whether you're talking about what a woman is or what a man is. The reason these conversations are typically put in terms of womanhood is I would think um, because it's, women's spaces that are most controversial. Um, a lot of gender critical feminists and radical feminists are concerned that they're losing the ability to preserve and protect female only spaces, or as they would put it, women's only women's women's spaces. And so they're concerned about um, spaces like prisons and changing rooms and bathrooms and uh, sports teams and so on. Um, so that's really the the center of the controversy. And so that's why the conversation typically happens in terms of what a woman is. But if people really insist, um, we could have the conversation in terms of what a man is, but really it would, it would proceed in basically the same way. So that's, that's one way to respond to this kind of objection if you get it. And um, even if the person you're talking to says, you know, I'm not a man and I'm also not a woman, I'm non-binary. I think that <clears throat> if you ask them what it means to be non-binary, so the typical definition you'll get is, well, I'm not a man, I'm not a woman, I'm, I'm not on the binary. Um, so it seems legitimate in that case to ask um, what, what a woman is and also what a man is if this, if this person feels in a position to say, I'm not a man and I'm not a woman, you'd think the person should have opinion about, an opinion about what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman. So anyway, those are, those are some strategies to kind of sidestep this standpoint epistemology complication. So one of the other responses that was given to this question that was sort of a non-response was, why do you even care? Like, why do you uh, care? Yeah, Where did yeah you right. Um, <laughs> so that happened on that Dr. Phil appearance that Matt Walsh had. Why do you even care? Well, and it I also thought, happened with uh, Dr. Patrick Grzonka. Oh, right, yeah, am I saying yeah. that right, Grzonka? I don't know. I hope yeah, I, I am. Have, yeah, I am. I don't know Grzonka. what the right pronunciation is. Yeah, he was like, he was like, well, why do you even care? 
Yeah. Why do you even care to ask that question? And Matt's response was like, well, I care about truth. And later on, like after talking with the, uh, what was what was her name? I don't have any of these, mem these names memorized. Scott Nugent, which was the, uh, the founder of Tree Voices. And her, her story was uh, actually really heartbreaking. She was a biological woman, transitioned to a man. And now uh, I don't know if they actually covered it in the documentary, but she now identifies as a female again. I, 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 do you remember? Um, I don't remember how that story ended. I'm not sure. Okay. You might be right. Yeah. So you're yeah. saying Matt Walsh gave a similar sort of response. Um, well, I remember the Dr. Phil. I think after, said, yeah, I care, after I care about children, I care about exactly women. Yeah. Maybe this question wouldn't arise if the, if his approach to the issue had been phrased in terms of what is a man, then maybe the people under the influence of this kind of standpoint epistemology wouldn't think it appropriate to ask, why do you care? Because from, from their perspective, you have the right standing to ask about this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, maybe another benefit of just switching to what's a man is this sort of why do you care question doesn't arise. But I thought, I, th I think it's a perfectly acceptable response to say, I, I'm, I'm, I just care about what's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could also mention what's at stake, you know, again, um, women's spaces are uh, a big part of this controversy. You could mention that, you know, I'm concerned about that. But yeah, I think, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's not... It's not the sort of question a philosopher would ask. I think that's, that's, I don't know. It has a sort of rhetorical power, like, why do you care? But it shouldn't really be relevant me, to the truth of the questions we're asking. I want to ask you a question. What was your favorite interview? Um, what was my favorite interview? Well, I guess, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever watched the British version of The Office. Did you ever watch that? Like the original Ricky Gervais? I've watched version? like one episode of it. Yeah. It's so awkward that it's like almost painful to watch. You're cringing the whole time, but you like can't look away. Um, it's sort of like, you know, people who have a taste for extremely sour candy. You're like, why are you eating that? Or really spicy food. You're like, why are you doing that? And you're like, you just can't stop. It's painful, but I can't stop. For me, that interview was that, um, university of Tennessee professor whose name we don't quite know how to pronounce Patrick, whatever. Um, that was, was yeah, that was like watching the British version of the office for me. It was, it was so awkward <laughs> and, um, I was just cringing the whole time. Um, so I, I didn't I, yeah. like how the answer, like, so Matt asked, what's the difference between sex and gender? Like, that's how he starts out that yeah. interview. Yeah. And he, I don't like how they actually cut up his response, you know, because yeah. I, I would have preferred to just listen to like what he had to say in response to that. And that's probably what we would have done. Like if I had been interviewing him on this channel was like just letting him have his time to, to talk and then try to interact with it afterward. But what they did in the documentary was they cut it up. And made it seem like he gave this really long, like drawn out philosophical answer that didn't really have any place that it was going. And then Matt just like, so is there a difference between <laughs> sex and gender? Yeah. And I, I just wish they hadn't have done that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, the impression given by cutting up that answer was this was just inordinately long and um, word salad. Point. Yeah, word salad never really got an answer. I mean, um, I hope they do. I hope that Matt Walsh's team releases the uncut footage so we can see what the answer really was. But I wouldn't be surprised if that's what it was, if it was just sort of rambling word salad. Um, but it was a little um, unsatisfying, even after Matt Walsh asks the follow-up and says, so are they different? Um, then that professor said, well, gender and sex are different constructs, but they're deeply intertwined with each other. Yeah. And um, I wasn't very satisfied with that answer because um, I'm not really into obscurantism and metaphors. And you get like two metaphors for the price of one there with that answer. We're told the gender and sex are constructs. Um, and also they're intertwined, deeply intertwined. Um, yeah. So we get a lot, of, a lot of metaphorical talk there, but never really a clear answer. So I, I thought something we could do just briefly together is um, you know for the purposes of people who maybe just watched that documentary and are thinking about these issues for the first time, I thought it might be nice to try to state clearly and succinctly, um, try to answer that question, are gender and sex different? Because even when Matt Walsh talks to an ideological fellow traveler, um, I believe her name is Miriam Grossman, Matt Walsh asks her 
um, you know, what's the difference between gender and sex? What is gender and what is sex? Um, Miriam Grossman says, and this is a, I'm pretty sure this is a direct quote. I was writing this down while watching the video, but I think she says something like sex is biology. Sex is unchanging. Sex is based on chromosomes. So I wasn't totally satisfied with that answer um, because sure, sex is biological. Um, that's merely a necessary condition. You know, a lot is biological, not just sex. Uh, she says sex is unchanging. And I worry that, or um, I worry that if people who are new to the debate saw that and thought, oh, that's the view that, you know, if I'm interested in defending the traditional view of what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a man, I've got to take on board the claim that sex is immutable, that it doesn't change. I worry about that because um, if you have that view and you walk into conversations about this topic, you're immediately going to hear about clownfish <laughs> and other sorts of species that are um, sequential hermaphrodites that literally do change their sex over the course of their lifetimes. Biological sex is, in principle, the sort of thing that could change. It never has and never does for humans. But if you want to properly understand what biological sex is, you should acknowledge that the definition of male and the definition of female are such that an organism could hypothetically be male at one stage of life and be female at a later stage of life and even go back. And not just hypothetically, maybe, as I said, this really, this really happens. Maybe to defend her, to be sort of charitable in context, she was just talking about humans. Yes. Yes, I agree. She was just talking about humans. But it's good to make that like, it's good to make that clarification yeah. regardless. But I mean, biological sex is not just a human phenomenon. It's all over right. the animal kingdom, all over the plant kingdom. And so, yeah, I don't think w if you're wondering what is biological sex, you shouldn't start with our own species. And you should, even if you start with our own species, you, you shouldn't stay there. You should think about what is it that all males have in common across the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom? What is it that all females have, have in common? And if you think about that, you'll quickly realize, well, um, biological sex is not really, um, she said, based on chromosomes. It's depends on what she meant by based on chromosomes. In humans, that's um, our biological sex is determined uh, genetically. So it is determined by our chromosomes. But chromosomes don't figure into the definition of what it is to be male or what it is to be female. And certainly not in the case of being male. No part of that definition is going to mention having XY chromosomes because there are males in other species that do it very differently genetically. Um, so chromosomes don't figure into the definition of biological sex. Neither do genitalia, neither do hormone levels. Um, if you think about extremely simple sorts of organisms that reproduce sexually, um, they do it very differently from us when it comes to genitalia and hormones. Um, what all males have in common is just this. Um, they produce sperm when functioning properly and females produce eggs, produce ova when functioning properly. That's all it is to be male. That's all it is to be female. So that's what biological sex is. Um, also, when asked what gender is, this same interviewee, Miriam Grossman, said, gender is perception. It's a feeling, a way of identifying. It's an experience. So gender, we're told by, again, this is an ideological fellow traveler with Walsh. This is somebody like on the same team, so to speak. We're told gender is a perception, it's a feeling, it's a way of identifying, it's an experience. So these are probably all necessary conditions for what's often called what's often called gender identity, but they're certainly not sufficient conditions because there are lots of other things that are perceptions, feelings, ways of identifying experiences that have nothing to do with gender. You might think, um, I don't know, what's an example of something that's a feeling, way of identifying a certain kind of experience? Um, I don't know, is being Californian, does that count? Being a Californian? Is that like a way of identifying? That's one way that I identify. Sure. Is it a feeling? I don't know. Is it an experience? Certainly had a lot of Californian experiences. Um, but you get the idea. There are other like aspects of your identity that might be based on a feeling or an experience or something that don't have anything to do with gender. So she just gave us some necessary conditions and probably just necessary conditions for gender identity. Um, and it's important to point out that's not the only way that the word gender is used. It doesn't always mean um, an internal sense of 
one's gender, whatever gender is. So um, I think here's a clear and succinct way of answering the question, um, what is gender? I think the answer is the word gender is multiply ambiguous. It's been used in many different ways by many different people. Sometimes it's used as just a polite way of talking about biological sex, it's sort of like a more politically correct, tactful way of talking about biological sex. You don't have to say the word sex. You just say gender. It's kind of a polite way of asking, what's your bio biological sex? But we just use this word gender. So sometimes it just means biological sex. Um, yeah, recently I just wanted an example of a kind of primitive organism that reproduces sexually. And so I searched just to double check, like what's going on with starfish. I just wanted to check. And the article I found talked about um, the gender of starfish and what it means to be a male starfish and female, but it used the word gender. So that's just one example of um, an instance where the word gender was being used just as a synonym for biological sex. Sometimes the word gender is used as the genus of femininity and masculinity. So femininity is sort of stereotypes, expectations that we have of females. Masculinity are the sort of stereotypes, expectations, and so on that we have of males. But um, we didn't really have a word for what these are two types of. And so gender was sort of co-opted from linguistics, from grammar, to be the genus for femininity and masculinity. And the people who originally did that, people like John Money and Robert Stoller, I think were pretty explicit that that's what they were using the word to mean. Um, the genus, the category that encompasses femininity and masculinity. Sometimes the word gender is the genus um, for the words woman and man. If you wanted to know, um, you know, woman and man, what are these two types of, what are these two examples of? Um, sometimes the word gender is used in that way. And we're told woman and man are gender terms. These are gender terms. Um, so sometimes that's the way the word gender, gender is used. I've just got a couple more. <laughs> um, that was three so far. Here's number four. Uh, sometimes when people talk about gender, um, they mean, uh, social roles that are, um, typed by sex, sex typed social roles what are sometimes called gender roles or gender norms. So the sort of behaviors that we associate with females and males um, in our species, um, the sort of styles of expression or dress, the positions occupied in society, typically by males and females. Sometimes that's what people mean by gender. <clears throat> they mean gender roles. Okay, and then finally, sometimes what people mean by gender is um, what's often called gender identity gender as identity. Originally, back when people like Robert Stoller introduced this word, um, gender identity, what Stoller had in mind was an internal sense of your sex, an internal sense of what sex you are, whether you're male or female. Um, that's originally what gender identity meant. So there, gender was sort of being used as a synonym for sex. It's sex identity. But these days, um, when people talk about gender identity, they seem to not have in mind your internal sense of your own sex. They have in mind an internal sex of your gender. <laughs> but as to what gender means there, that is very much uh, up for debate and unclear. Um, yeah, it means something I know not what. Um, okay, so that's a sort of catalog of all the ways that the word gender is used. Um, I have a nice quotation here from Sally Haslinger, who's a trans inclusive philosopher at MIT back in 2000, she said, within these debates, not only is it unclear what gender is and how we should go about understanding it, but whether it is anything at all. So it's just one example of people acknowledging in the literature that this word gender is multiply ambiguous. So if Matt Walsh had asked me, is there a sex gender distinction? I would have said, well, here's what biological sex is. Males produce sperm when functioning properly. Females produce eggs when functioning properly. Here are all the things gender could mean. And then you just have to go through the list and check whether um, on each of these items in the list, there's a difference between sex and gender. So on the first item, when we said gender just is biological sex, well, then there's no sex gender distinction. Um, the second item, when we said it's the genus of femininity and masculinity, well, then, yeah, obviously femininity is different from being female. Femininity are the sort of expectations that we have of females. Those expectations of females are different from actually being female. 
and so on. You can finish the list yourself. Um, but that's what I would have done. I would have gone through the list and checked whether uh, on each sense of the word gender, it's different from sex. So um, that's how I would have answered if I had been in that University of Tennessee professor's position. He probably would have just like done the thing where he like goes through and fast forwards what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, just a yes or no will do, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's part of the reason why I didn't like that that portion well, of it. Unfortunately, yeah, the, the, oh, this, this debate is sort of plagued by this ambiguity in the word gender and people have these conversations using the word gender as though we all know what's being said. But people end up talking past each other. People end up confusing themselves and their conversation partners. So I um, actually just had a debate yesterday about this topic. And if you watch it, you'll see that I was just very careful to, I don't think I use the word gender at all um, because I think that only muddies the water. Um, if you want to talk about femininity and masculinity, just talk about that. If you want to talk about men and women, just talk about that. There's really no need to bring in the word gender. Just pick the sense you're interested in and go with that. Ditch the word gender. Just specify the mm -hmm. sense. What would you say to kind of change gears a little bit? What would you say was like the main point that this documentary was trying to make? Um, or like, what are some of the, I mean, what are some of the main takeaways like that it was trying to instill in the audience? I mean, some of the bigger points yeah. to me I were, was, I mean, the, go, Oh, sorry. You were going to answer. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think that one item on his agenda and probably pretty high on the list was to cast doubt upon the so-called experts in this area because a, a lot of people um, defer to uh, you know gender studies professors and the sort of physicians that perform these transitions and surgeries and so on and so i think um, i mean if i understand matt walsh's mo he does enjoy kind of taking people down a peg or debunking elitists elitists who he would view as sort of smug um, and so I thought that was the first half of the film where he's like having these interviews and talking to experts. I felt like um, one item on his agenda was to show that they're actually pretty confused. Um, and yeah, they don't understand the issues clearly themselves. That was, I, I would say that was one main point of the documentary. What were you going to say? Well, I think that like with the whole discussion on like the chemical castration drug, Lupron, I think that was the name of it like that i hadn't heard about that before like the uh the hormone blockers and stuff and how dangerous those could be and how yeah. there's like no studies on the long-term side effects of what those drugs can actually do and how in the interview like sorry i've got dogs barking in the background but uh some of the, the yes yeah, the side effects are not really well known and how one of the interviewees what was her name michelle she was talking she's the pediatrician she's saying how like th you could just put a pause on puberty and like pick it up later and how it's just like there's no problems with that and how they were trying to highlight in the film that like there's no studies on that there's no real evidence that suggests that it's like just that easy i thought that was one of the main points that they wanted to make was like highlighting yeah. some of the the dangers of the whole transition yeah. movement yeah, and, I think and there, some of the stuff that really isn't really talked about there seem to be two halves of the documentary and the first half was a little more lighthearted and he's having these mm -hmm. interviews and making people look kind of silly um, and it's sort of humorous, but then the tone definitely changes in the second half. Um, and there I would say, I that think that's when, when they change to talking about when they start yes. to interview the athletes. Yeah. He starts talking about sports. Um, and as you said, um, the sort of treatments that are given to young people when transitioning, um, I feel like there's something else he brought up, but yeah, it was very much, I thought the, the main item on the agenda for that second half was to be a bit alarmist. Oh, also this, the sort of gender ideology that's being taught in schools. That's another thing that he spent a lot of time on. So yeah, I thought the purpose of that second half was to raise an alarm and say like, you know, we don't know about long-term effects. Look what's being taught in schools, look what's happening to women's sports and so on. Um, so yeah, the, their, um, the topic shifted from sort of philosophical conceptual investigation of what a woman is and what is sex and what is gender and so on to uh, more empirical claims about like the consequences of this sort of ideology. So I, I wanted to, that was, to point, that was the point of the movie here. Yeah. I'm going to let you kind of pick up 
just in a second, but I did want to let the audience know that we're going to do some Q&A. So if you have a question for Dr. Bogardis, then leave it in the live chat. And Super Chats, I mentioned this in the live chat earlier, but Super Chats are actually being matched today by a generous donor. So if you'd like to send in your question as a Super Chat, it will be matched up to $1,000. So that's pretty cool. But if you would like to uh, leave a question, then leave it in the live chat. And I'll, I'll do my best to keep an eye on it. We're going to transition to questions in about uh, hopefully around five minutes. So let's just try to, I know that there's a lot more for us to talk about with this documentary, but uh, maybe some of the, the main points that you wanted to make before we move to Q&A. Yeah, well, I had a couple other things I could talk about. Um, they are, well, the, uh, there's a risk that they will rehash things I said a few weeks ago on your channel. Um, so I could just try to focus on the bits that are new, or if you wanted to, we could just go to Q&A now. Um, or I'll just try to quickly summarize without repeating too much of what I said a few. Well, weeks I mean, ago. it's to, it's also okay to repeat some of what you've said already because some people haven't watched that other interview. Okay. So okay, yeah. Well, let me let me say this. Um, here's something I was a little unsatisfied with. Like, we never actually got a clear statement of um, what it is, what biological sex is, or what it is to be male, or what it is to be female. So I hope to have remedied remedied that a little bit. Um, and in fact. I mean, although Matt Walsh sort of enjoys um, befuddling people by, by asking them, you know, what is a woman and seeing how they're not very, not very good at responding. Um, when Matt Walsh has been asked, what is a female? I haven't been super impressed with the responses. He was actually asked that in the Dr. Phil appearance. I don't think it made it into the documentary, but um, he typically gives answers having to do with chromosomes, um, maybe even genitals. I mean, one of the answers we got from somebody in the movie when asked, you know, how do you know you're a man? We got an answer in terms of genitals. And that was left like unchallenged by Matt Walsh. Um, and he says things like, you know, when you're female, it's in every cell of your body. And if we dug you up a thousand years after your death, scientists would be able to tell whether you're male and female. Um, but again, this doesn't quite get to the, the essence of what it is to be male or female. Um, so it would have been nice if the documentary had covered that. And again, um, I think that these concepts are defined in terms of um, gamete production when functioning properly. That's all it is. Producing sperm when functioning properly, that's a male. Um, I'm adding the when functioning properly bit because there are males who due to injury, disease, old age, and so on, don't produce sperm. There are females who due to injury, disease, old age, whatever, um, immaturity, whatever, don't produce ova. Nevertheless, it's still true of any member of the subtype of this species, female, that when functioning properly, um, when flourishing, when reaching full maturity, you get these sorts of gametes. Okay, um, but something else that was a little unsatisfying was it wasn't until the very end when I think he asks his wife what a woman is, and then she says adult human female, and then the movie ends <laughs> pretty soon after that. I think maybe immediately after that. Um, but... We never really got any arguments for that or evidence for that, as far as I could tell. There were no reasons. And yeah, it was almost that. like it was almost like this assumption that because you can give like a little pithy answer, like it's that's obviously yeah. the true one. Yeah, so it would have been nice. Um, would have been nice to hear some reasons to think that that's what the word woman means. That's what it, that's what it refers to. So um, here are some reasons. Just quickly uh, rehashing. I think my. One of my favorite reasons, um, if you're just wondering, like, what, what does the word typically mean? Uh, what does the word woman typically mean? Um, and what does the word man typically mean ordinarily, traditionally? Um, if you think about other species and notice that for species that we come in close contact with, especially via agriculture, or domestication or whatever, we tend to have an interest in tracking um, an important distinction within these species, the distinction between the adult males and the adult females of the species, and also the juvenile males and the juvenile females of the species. This is often an important distinction to us. It's a distinction in nature. It's important to us. So we name it um, and we come up with terms for the adult males and the adult females of these species. We do this for cows and horses and ducks and rabbits and so on, deer. Um, now, wouldn't it stand to reason that we would have done the same thing with humans? 
we're very closely acquainted with our own species. Wouldn't it be just totally surprising if we didn't introduce words to track this very important distinction in our own species, the distinction between the adult males and the adult females, and the distinction between the juvenile males and the juvenile females. And it sure looks like that's what man, woman, boy, and girl are doing. Um, so there's one argument. It's, I mean, it's not conclusive. It's just, you know, this is an empirical question about what words refer to, but there's, there's some reason to think that, yeah, we probably would have come up with words to track these distinctions and woman and man, boy and girl are the best candidates. Okay. Um, that's one reason. Another reason is, um, this is the dictionary, adult human female, or some variation of that is the definition you'll find in virtually all dictionaries. If you look up woman, um, the Oxford English dictionary says, there's a whole bunch of senses relating to adult female human being. The first one is an adult female human being. <laughs> um, so some people scoff when you bring up a dictionary. They're like, you can't settle philosophical questions via the dictionary. And I agree that dictionaries often make mistakes, especially with like difficult concepts like knowledge and justice um, and consciousness, like those really thorny philosophical concepts. Um, the dictionary is a very imperfect guide to the meaning of those words. But the job of lexicographers when they're compiling dictionaries is to do their best to figure out what ordinary people mean when they use these words. Of course, the lexicographers can make mistakes. Um, but the fact that this is a definition that shows up in virtually all dictionaries is some evidence um, that that's what the word ordinarily means. And also you could put the argument this way, and this is, this is sort of new. Um, I think we would all agree um, even people who don't like this definition, I think they'd agree that if the dictionary said something other than adult human female for woman, if it had said something like, oh, woman, that's anyone who identifies as a woman, then people who are into that self identity, that self identity definition would say, ah, see, look, look what the dictionary says. Um, then they would have celebrated what the dictionary says. And if the dictionary had said something other than adult human female, when you look up woman, that would have been evidence against the view that woman ordinarily means adult human female. So if adult human female hadn't been in the dictionary, that would have been evidence against the view that ordinarily people mean adult human female when they say woman. But if that's true, then it just follows and we can like, I can give you some examples and we can go through the math of why this follows. But then it follows, rationality requires us to believe that, oh, well then if the dictionary says adult human female for woman, that's evidence for the view that that's what people ordinarily mean when they say the word. Does that make sense? So if the dictionary had said something else that would have been evidence against the adult human female view. So the fact that the dictionary says adult human female is evidence for um, the adult human female view. Okay, so there's an argument from the dictionary that I think probably works. But also I'll just mention, and I mentioned this in that little debate I did last night on modern day debates that um, virtually all philosophers working in this area agree and concede that that's what the word ordinarily means. Ordinarily, traditionally, historically, when people use the word woman, they express the concept that refers to adult human females. And these philosophers are perturbed by that and they think that's problematic and it needs to be changed. And so that's why they're engaged in these revisionary projects of trying to come up with a new concept to be expressed with the word woman because they acknowledge that the way things stand is um, deficient in some way. They think it's bad that ordinarily people are expressing adult human female with the word woman and they want to change it. But all that to say, they concede that Ordinarily, that is what people mean when they when they say the word woman. They mean adult human female. That's what the word means in dominant mainstream context, they'll say. Um, so yeah, those are reasons that Matt Walsh could have given um, if he wanted to actually support the view that was expressed by his wife at the end of the movie. Yeah, uh, okay, sir. So are you... Uh... I think this is a good time to transition to some Q&A with the audience. I think it's got a good time. Really good questions in. Let's okay, cool. So before we do that, I want to tell you about my friend. His name is Mark Lozano over at Christ Center Capital. Go look up the website. I've got it linked in the description of this video as well. Christcenteredcapital.com. What he does is he provides an ethical screening of financial assets like stocks and cryptos and stuff. 
I actually just did an in-person interview with him in my studio. We talked about like what he, like his background and kind of like where he came at. He was an atheist for a while. He became a Christian, he became Catholic, but he, he decided like he was working in the NBA and he realized when he became a Christian that a lot of the things that he was investing in were supporting pornography. They were supporting uh, just a, a, like abortion, a, ba a bunch of bad things that these companies were investing in and, and they were supporting. And so he decided, hey, look, I need to, with the luxury money that I've got, I've got to be investing in, uh, uh, I've got to be investing wisely and I've got to be investing in a way that is consistent with his new crowd, his newfound Christian morality. One of the things that we talked about during our interview is the fact that when you actually invest in a company, you're making that company more powerful. And so we want to be as Christians, we want to be investing in companies that align with our Christian morality. We want to make those companies more powerful, those companies to have more influence. And so that's why I think that you should be interested in this type of service that he provides. Now, this used to be a paid service. This used to cost $7 a month. You had to pay money in order to actually like sign up for this and get the financial information that he's sending out. But instead, now it's it's completely 100% free. If you go to ChristCenterCapital.com, you can sign up for their newsletter. You can donate if you want, but it's a, it's a completely free service. We talked about why he transitioned to this sort of free model. Recently in our interview, I'll be posting it on the channel in a couple of weeks. But it's just, I, I can't say enough about how important this is. If you're in, in, if you're investing your money at all, if you've got a 401k and you sort of just like your money is being invested and you don't really know what it's being invested in, you need to be like actively questioning that, I think, as a Christian. You've got to actually like do the hard work, contact your 401k, contact whoever's managing this and be like, hey, what are you actually putting this money into? Anyways, you, you got to go check them out. ChristCenterCapital.com. They can help you out. They've done all the hard work for you. It's definitely something that you need to check out. ChristCenterCapital.com. All right. So let's now turn to some Q&A. And as I mentioned, we've already got a bunch that have been sent in. Here is the, uh, the first question from Maverick Christian. Thank you for your super chat. And again, all of the super chats today are going to be met. We've got a generous, very, very generous donor who is matching up to $1,000 in Super Chats that are sent in. I don't know that we'll actually meet that threshold, but we we had to put a cap on it anyways. But if I mean, if we do meet that threshold, that'd be amazing. It would really help out and support the ministry. So Maverick Christian, he says, Hi, Thomas. What is your opinion of the recent debate with Vosh? You know the debate is polarized when you have trouble agreeing that water is H2O. I actually watched that part of the debate too, so it was, it was pretty interesting to see that. Yeah. Um, well, as you might have noticed, I did um, prepare quite a bit for that debate. So this debate happened mm -hmm. at a, a YouTube channel called Modern Day Debate. If you just want to go watch it, it just happened last night, um, Modern Day Debate. So yeah, I watched a lot of his videos to try to get a sense of what his views were. Um, took a lot of notes, um, collected a lot of quotations, uh, did some research, as they say. Um, so I had a pretty good idea of what I was getting into um, and so I guess I would just say that I think that was a good plan to prepare in that way because I, um, there weren't really any surprises. I sort of knew all the moves he might make. And, um, and so, yeah, it was just good to be prepared. And I did think it would probably be most useful, as I said, during the debate to focus on physics and chemistry where claims about like everything being a social construction are the least plausible. So that's why I kept trying to like draw the conversation back to gold and water and protons and so on. Um, so yeah, I, that's, I think that helped keep things clear and on track, but um, yeah, I, I guess I don't want to say too much more about it. You can, you can watch the debate for yourself. I think I was satisfied with how it went. Um, so yeah, you can you can go check it out. Okay, fair enough. So T for Fortune says, uh, thank you for your super chat. Is sex the category and gender just the stereotypes, archetypes of that category? Is sex the category and gender is just the stereotypes or archetypes of that category? Well, I think sex is a category. It's a type of thing and there's two subtypes, male and female. Um, and then we're wondering, is gender just the stereotypes or archetypes of that category? Well, I think what might, um, what Tifer might be getting at here is one of the senses of gender I mentioned, um, according to which 
it's a sex typed social role, what we sometimes call gender roles um, or gender norms. Or maybe what Tifer has in mind is a sense of the word gender on which it refers to femininity and masculinity, which are sort of stereotypes and expectations of females in the case of femininity. Masculinity is stereotypes and expectations associated with males. So if that's what you mean by gender, if you mean femininity and masculinity, then yeah, sex is the category. And then gender is like stereotypes and expectations of the subtypes of that category. Um, something that's interesting about this definition, by the way, if that's what you mean by gender, then gender is actually defined in terms of sex. So for example, on the definition of gender where you say, well, what I mean is the genus of femininity and masculinity. If you then ask, what is femininity? The answer mentions sex. These are the um, expectations um, and stereotypes of females. And similarly with masculinity, those are expectations and stereotypes of males. So one interesting implication then is there will only be as many genders as there are sexes. If gender is defined in terms of the sexes, then the number of genders that you would have on this view is limited by the number of sexes that you have on this view. Um, now, some people have said that, you know, there's very, there's more than two sexes. Um, but I think a lot of people acknowledge that when it comes to biological sex, sexual reproduction, uh, nature has settled on two, two sexes, male and female. Although again, quickly add that there are species that change sex over the course of their lifetimes. And there are species that are simultaneous hermaphrodites. I mentioned last time garden snails are each garden snail is both male and female at the same time, but still just two sexes. So I just thought I'd point that out. If that's what your conversation partner decides to mean by gender, then one implication is there will only be as many genders as there are sexes. And your conversation partner may not like that implication. All right, next question is from Tygo. He says, do you think TRAs, and you're gonna have to help me with this abbreviation, use gender in a purposely confusing way so it can, be, so it can imply different things when convenient? Um, so I think Tiago by TRA means trans rights activists. <clears throat> so just people on the sort of trans inclusive side of this debate. And the question is, do I think that they're kind of acting in bad faith or insincerely or being sort of sneaky or deceptive or something like that? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that unfortunately, I mean, if you just watch Matt Walsh's conversation with that gender studies professor and other conversations as well, people just use this word gender as though it's clear what we're talking about um and i think they're they're sort of taught if they if they were gender studies majors or if they studied something like this in college they were just sort of taught that well yeah you know um, gender that's well understood now let us sort of investigate the nature of gender or something like that but we all have a pre-theoretical grasp on what we're talking about but I don't think that's the case. I think that the word gender is importantly different from other terms that we investigate when we do philosophy. <clears throat> so for example, you bring into the philosophy classroom with you um, a pre-theoretical grasp of, for example, knowledge, consciousness, justice, um, moral permissibility, moral obligation, um, free will, you sort of bring these concepts into the philosophical classroom. These were already things that you were thinking about, that you were acquainted with outside of philosophy. You bring it into the philosophy classroom and then you start thinking about what this is. Um, but gender was not that way. The word gender um, in the mid 1900s was purposely, intentionally brought in from um, the study of grammar, from linguistics, where if you've studied other languages, Maybe you've heard it, you know, in some languages, um, nouns are gendered and so on. Um, but that was a sort of grammatical phenomenon. But because people like John Money and Robert Stoller, they didn't have a word for the genus of femininity and masculinity. Um, they didn't have a word for the genus of man and woman. They just borrowed this word that was being used in linguistics and said, let's just use that one. And so it has always been a technical term. It has never been a sort of ordinary term that um, was something we were all acquainted with and we were all talking about the same thing when we use the term. It's always been defined um, by stipulative definitions. 
Um, and so I think that has led to confusion because people can people mistakenly think, oh, the word gender, that's like knowledge and consciousness and justice. This is something I have a pre-theoretical grasp on. I kind of know what gender is already, um, but I'm going to think about it more carefully in, in the philosophy room. But I don't think that's the case. I think what you have to do when you're studying this kind of technical term is just specify which stipulative definition are we interested in. Do we want to talk about gender roles? Do we want to talk about femininity and masculinity? Do we want to talk about biological sex? Which one are we talking about? Um, so yeah, I think that due to the kind of origin story of this word, I think that explains why people are confused um, and why the word is kind of multiply ambiguous. I, I wouldn't chalk it up to bad intentions. No, I think I think we're I think people are just mistaken. So Tiago, he's got a, a few other questions that he sent in. He says, why include animals on the definition? Can't we just analyze human sex as a separate category? Doesn't functioning properly become circular? Oh, wow. Um, so those are three different questions. Why include animals yeah. on the definition of male and female? Well, I guess because, um, like, again, if we're just wondering, what do these words mean? Like, what do biologists mean when they talk about male and female? What are they referring to? I think we would have to take into account the fact that they apply this word to non-human animals very regularly. And so if we are just trying to understand what the word means, we need to take into consideration that it's something attributed rightly to non-human animals. So that's why we should take it into consideration. It would be like, you know, you hear all this talk of carnivores and herbivores and so on, um, and you want to understand what that means. Well, I think it would be mistaken to say, well, let's just ignore other animals and just think about humans. Um, what is it for a human to be a carnivore? Well, then we might get answers about like a particularly human diet, like the sort of meat that humans tend to eat. Um, but I think that would be a mistake. We should think more broadly uh, about how the word is applied across the, the animal kingdom and similarly for biological sex. Um, yeah. Yeah. And in any event, there just does seem to be this phenomenon of sexual reproduction. And it's very important from a biological perspective, the way that creatures reproduce and the strategy that was adopted independently a few times in evolutionary history in order to increase genetic variation during the reproduction, reproduction, reproduction process. That's just an interesting phenomenon that, that should be studied. And it's, it's important to note that we share something in common with animals and plants in that way. Okay, the second question was, can't we just analyze human sex as a separate category? Um, well, let me think. So what would that mean? If you wanted to say, well, let, let me just kind of introduce a new word like human male or something like that. Uh, hue male and a hue female. Um, and then I want to figure out, you know, what is necessary and sufficient for a human to be male and what's necessary and sufficient for a uh, human to be female. Well, that's, yeah, I guess that very concept, even if we try to introduce a new concept, it's sort of parasitic upon or dependent upon this more basic concept of male and female. We'd first have to figure out who the males are in the human species and then try to figure out what those humans all have in common. Um, and I'm going to think it's not much besides being male. <laughs> Um, there will be, you know, tendencies and correlations with hormone levels and chromosomes and um, genitals and so on. But I think probably the only thing that all the human males have in common is, well, I guess they're all humans, we should say that. Um, but what only they have in common is um, being males as well. And similarly for the human females. So yeah, I guess that's why. And so it would be sort of dependent on this more basic concept of male and this more basic concept of female. Okay, the third question was, doesn't functioning properly become circular? I don't think so. And I guess Tiago would have to explain why, because I don't know why would why would think that. Just take a simple example of, um, you know, like an automobile or a car is supposed to start. Um, cars start. And what I mean when I say cars start is when they're functioning properly. That's something they're supposed to do. That's something they're designed to do. Got a little starter motor in there that gets things moving. Um, was this somehow circular? Why don't, it wasn't even, yeah, I don't know. Usually we use that word circular to describe definitions, but I didn't even give you a definition here. I just, 
I just said this is like cars start when functioning properly. So I don't even know if this is a candidate to be circular. But maybe the idea is, well, suppose you defined a male in terms of proper function. A male is an organism that produces sperm when functioning properly. Now did, did things get circular? I hope not, because if so, then we're going to have trouble defining what a heart is and defining what a kidney is and defining what a vertebrate is. Um, all of these things, I think, are defined in terms of proper function. And so if somehow proper function smuggles in some circularity, biology is going to be in trouble because this notion of proper function is ubiquitous in biology. Um, so the problem is going to overgeneralize. If this is a problem, it's going to overgeneralize. So modus tollens. Hopefully it's not a problem. <laughs> all right. So uh, Tiago says, thanks for all the answers. He sends in another super chat. And maybe part of the reason why he's doing this is because we have, again, if you're just joining us, oh, we've got right. a very generous donor who is matching all of the super chats that are sent in today up to $1,000. So uh, Tiago, he's got another question. He says, steel manning the trans rights activist position. If we take the expectations femininity as mere social conventions, we don't need to base them in sex. What are your thoughts? If we take expectations, i.e. femininity, as mere social conventions, we don't need to base them in sex. Um, well, I think one use of the word femininity does just refer to um, social opinions, social conventions. I think it's an open question whether any of these opinions are actually true. In the same way that, you know, sometimes people use the word morality to mean just the sort of dominant moral opinions in a culture. You know, so they'll say things like cultures have differed when it comes to morality. What they mean is their moral beliefs were different. Their moral opinions were different. But if you're a moral realist, you'll think, you know, morality has been the same everywhere and for everyone. Morality doesn't change. Um, people's opinions about what the moral facts are have changed, but morality hasn't changed. So I think something similar applies to these sorts of gender norms and gender expectations. We might just mean people's opinions about, you know, how women and men ought to behave. And that certainly has varied across time and culture. But if there are any actual truths of this form, sort of gender specific truths about how people ought to behave in order to be an excellent woman or, or in order to be an excellent man, then those are the sorts of things that wouldn't actually change across time and culture. It's just some cultures would have true opinions about these norms and others would have false opinions about these norms. Okay, but the real question was, <laughs> what if we took femininity um, to just be a social convention? Um, could you put the question back up for a second, Cameron? Oh uh, yeah, then we wouldn't need to base them in sex. Well, I guess what I would wonder is, um, how is femininity being defined then? These are going to be social conventions, but that's just a necessary condition. What else would be needed to make these social conventions the femininity social conventions? Because, you know, there are lots of other social conventions. There are conventions about how doctors should behave and how police officers should behave and how professors should behave. There's a whole lot of social conventions. So um, the social conventions that we're picking and saying, ah, these are the conventions of femininity. Why did we pick those? I would have thought it's because those are the conventions about how females should behave. Those are the expectations of females. Those are the stereotypes about females. So I would have thought you would have to define it in terms of sex. If you say, no, I don't want to define it in terms of sex, then I guess the challenge is just, how, what is it then? You know, how is it defined? You gave me one necessary condition. Femininity is going to be a set of social conventions. Okay, but which ones? Yeah. All right. So we've got a question from the whole life. He says, does Dr. Bugardis think being transgender is comparable to being trans race or trans species or trans height? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So let's try to untangle this question. So here's a common question put to trans inclusive philosophers who are engaged in the kind of project of um, abandoning the traditional meaning of the word woman, abandoning that traditional concept, adult human female, and trying to engineer um, a new concept to express with that old word. So um, they call that process conceptual engineering or ameliorative inquiry. And they think 
these philosophers think we should do that for the sake of social justice, for the great goods that will be produced. If we um, stop expressing the concept adult human female with this word woman and start expressing a new concept, one that includes um, uh, trans individuals who identify as women. Okay, a, a, an objection often put to these philosophers is, why don't you do that with um, our race concepts or our age concepts or our, I guess one of the other examples from the questioner is our height concepts. We, I mean, in the quest for social justice, when it came to, you know, the civil rights movement, um, when it came to ra when it came to race issues, we didn't engage in this sort of revisionary project. Instead, we sort of trimmed away negative stereotypes and negative connotations that were sort of um, occluding and hovering over our race concepts. We, we got rid of that. We, we said like, you know, you have negative opinions of people of a certain ancestry. Cut it out, those negative opinions are unjustified. But we didn't revise the ancestry concepts. We didn't revise the race concepts to mean something else. Um, and we've done similar things for age, you know, like ageism is a real thing. People have negative um, stereotypes and there's negative connotations associated with, you know, being old or being elderly or being a senior. That's a real thing. Um, but we haven't changed the meanings of the words. We haven't said, well, let's revise the concept expressed by the word senior or elderly so that it means something else. We didn't do that. Um, so yeah, I think a, a reasonable question is, what's the difference? Why do philosophers think we should do it in the case of our gender terms? Why should we engage in this conceptual engineering with gender, but not with these other concepts? And I'll just say that's a pretty tricky business. And as far as I can tell, um, nobody's quite put their finger on it, but I think, I think the answer really just has to be this. Um, the sort of moral calculus doesn't call for it at the current time with regard to these other categories, with regard to race and age um, and height and so on. There's just not enough social good that would be produced by revising our concepts in this way. But if the math changed, if the moral calculations changed, then I think a philosopher who's doing this with gender terms should consistently say, yeah, this consistency would require saying, yeah, we should do it with these other categories as well. All right. So flame on YouTube. He says, thank you guys for sending in these super chats, by the way. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll mention it one last time for the interview, is that everything, all of the Super Chats up to $1,000 are being matched by a very generous donor for Capturing Christianity, and that is going to help out the ministry a whole lot. So thank you guys for sending these in. Uh, all right, so he says, paraphrasing the whole life, how should Christians, especially in a high school setting, have good conversations with trans and affirming cis folks? Yeah. Hmm. Well, um, I guess I would say this. Um, yeah, uh, there's some instruction from um, Peter. I'm pretty sure it's, well, I guess I want to check it, look it up just to make sure real quick. I mean, St. Peter, V. Peter. Um, yeah, so it's First Peter. I just wanted to make, make sure it was First Peter. And, you know, this is Apologist's uh, favorite verse, um, First Peter 3.15. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And I remember the context, like the previous verse was interesting. Yeah. So um, verse 14, just right before that one says, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer, et cetera. So I think what Peter is telling us there as Christians is, um, there's a certain virtue to be had here that is a kind of mean between extremes when engaging with people who disagree with you. You want to kind of find a balance between um, sharing what you believe and being honest, not violating your conscience, you don't want to be frightened. It's a, he says, don't fear their threats. Do not be frightened. He's talking to people who are undergoing a really serious kind of persecution, right? There's, their lives are on the line. So he's saying, don't be frightened by their threats. Um, you need to be honest. Don't violate your conscience. 
speak up for what you believe in. But he adds at the same time, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Okay, so you're supposed to balance these two things, speaking the truth, but in love. So you want to speak the truth, but you don't want to be abrasive or aggressive or dismissive or dishonest or anything like that. Um, you want to speak the truth in love. Um, so there's a very general sort of abstract bit of advice as for how to apply that in particular conversations. Well, that's, that's the whole trick with the virtues. You know, we all know that courage is a virtue, but when it comes down to it, it's often hard to know exactly what sort of behaviors are required to be courageous in this particular circumstance. Um, the sort of virtue that Peter's recommending to us here is easy to understand in the abstract, but difficult to apply in a particular conversation. So I guess I would just say, um, here's a bit of advice that virtue ethicists often give you. Um, when you're trying to develop a virtue, you sort of fake it until you make it. Just pretend that you have the virtue, do your best to have the virtue. Um, start by just acting um, as virtuously as you can. And then that'll slowly develop into a habit and eventually a character trait. So I hope something in there was helpful, but I should probably stop that answer. Well, let's do this. So, so we'll do two more questions because we've only got you for another 10 minutes or so. So mm -hmm. let's do two more questions and then we'll close out the interview today. So this one is from Fused. He says, definition of female to the concept of intersex. Okay, so I think I understand the question. Um, and that was something I thought maybe we should bring up, but I was worried it would rehash some of the things we talked about in our last conversation. But I'll just briefly mention that I, I was a little underwhelmed by Matt Walsh's response to um, the uh, issue of intersex individuals, individuals who have differences or disorders of sexual development. Um, if I recall correctly, and I, I might just be misremembering, but I thought Matt Walsh's response is, well, this is very rare or something like that. But still, I think um, a, a, a better response should be given than just this is rare. Um, I think typically the reason these sorts of um, conditions are brought up um, is because people think, well, look, if you define woman as adult human female, if you think that's what the word woman ordinarily means, then you're sort of committed to there being biological sexes. And you probably think that biological sex is binary. There's just two um, sexes, male and female. And the assumption is, well, here's what it means for sex to be binary. Um, there's only two categories. They are uh, exclusive. You can't be both. They're exhaustive. You can't be neither. And everybody falls clearly into one of these categories. And I promise I'm not straw manning. I can provide quotes of people saying, this is the ordinary conception of sex exclusive, exhaustive, and everybody falls clearly, neatly and cleanly into one of these categories. Um, and so then these differences or disorders of sexual development are brought up um, as counterexamples to that notion of binary sex, because it looks like in these conditions, um, it's at least not clear whether the individual is male or female. Um, and some people say, some people think maybe there's even a third option here. So there's, there's more than two options. Maybe this person's neither male nor female or possibly both male and female. Um, and so these, um, cases are brought up as counterexamples to a particular notion of, uh, a particular understanding of what it would be for sex to be binary. But, um, I think that a proper understanding of biological sex would help you see that that's not what it means to say that sex is binary. It doesn't mean to say that the categories are exclusive, exhaustive, and everybody falls neatly and cleanly into one or the other. Um, there are organisms, as we've said, that are both male and female. And you can see that if you just reflect on the definition of male and female. Males produce sperm when functioning properly. Females produce eggs when functioning properly. You can see how an organism could do both. Garden snails do both. Each garden snail does both. There are simultaneous hermaphrodites. Um, so it's at least hypothetically possible that there be a human that's both male and female. I don't think that has ever happened. There are alleged cases of simultaneous hermaphrodites in humans. Um, but I think what you find when you look into it is um, it's pretty clear that this individual was either male or female. And although there was some sort of remnants of testicular tissue or ovarian tissue, um, this was never functional. 
And this was a result of a kind of disorder of sexual development. Okay. Um, oh, and also we should mention that there are organisms that are neither male nor female. There's a whole lot of organisms that don't reproduce sexually at all. So there's nothing in the definitions of male and female that require that um, everything be either male or female. And also there's just simply nothing in these definitions that require it to always be clear whether something is male or female. Um, as I shared last time, Simone de Beauvoir has a nice quote where she says, in nature, nothing is ever perfectly clear. And I think that's right. Virtually, well, I, I don't even want to say virtually, I think all of our biological concepts are vague and admit of borderline cases. Um, why think that the notions of biological sex, biological male and biological female would be any different? Okay, so I think that's a better, fuller response to uh, the issue of uh, intersex conditions. All right, so our last question today is from CD, and it has to do with your definitions of male and female. It's actually a really good question. All right, he says, does defining male or female by function mean it's literally impossible to change sex? If a male did an advanced surgery and now can produce eggs, is this person a properly functioning female or an improperly functioning male? Yeah, right. Um, so this didn't come up in my debate last night, but this uh, this Valsh fellow has brought up a case like that. Like, what if we could put you in a machine that would sort of zap your body and change you at the molecular level to make you a microphysical duplicate of, in my case, switch me from biologically male to biologically female? Would that, I mean, is it even hypothetically possible? Is it even theoretically possible to change sex? So I think um, given these definitions, it's at least... Um, there, there are, I think, situations where, yeah, it would be possible. If we did this, I think, um, if you took, like, maybe this CRISPR technology I hear about, well, let you do this one day. Take an embryo, a human embryo, that's XY, swap out the Y chromosome for an X chromosome. And I think the thing to say now, and I think Aristotle would say this, I think, I think the thing to say is this embryo now has the natural disposition to... Um, produce ova when functioning properly. I think that's the thing to say. Although there was this artificial intervention, still, I think the thing to say is now this embryo has all that's required and is sort of naturally disposed to go down the developmental pathway that results ultimately in ova. So that would be a kind of um, sex change, at least at the level of an embryo. It may be more complicated. Uh, it certainly would be more complicated for a full-grown human. But um, if the answer is just, is it conceptually possible to change sex? Yeah. I guess, you know, an easier answer would have just been, there are organisms that do change sex, <laughs> like the clownfish. So not only is it hypothetically possible for an organism to change sex, it actually happens. Um, yeah. But maybe the more relevant question is, is that actually now technologically feasible for humans? Does the technology exist to actually change a human's sex? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think we're there yet. It would take quite a lot more technological advancement to to reach that point. All right. I said we had two questions, but it's, we have a little bit more time. Are you okay if we take another one? We can do one more. Yeah. All right. One more. All right. From T for Fortune. Thanks for your super chat. He says, is there any credibility at all to the claim that gender ideology is communist <laughs> subversion? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Is it communist subversion? Um, I guess, may, let me try to understand the question. Um, you know, actually, the, my understanding of the way the Soviet Union was actually run, at least the Soviet Union, I thought, had some pretty rigid gender norms and a pretty high place for like the nuclear family, you know, like mother, father, children. I thought at least the way the Soviet Union was run, they actually, they did put great value on the family, at least maybe in the early days. I could be wrong about that. We should ask a historian. Um but there certainly are some people associated with like the far left wing of the political spectrum who seem to think that any sort of um, categories, any sort of, yeah, any sort of categories is ultimately going to result in a hierarchy and every hierarchy is going to result in oppression and suffering. And so some people th seem to think like what we need to do is explode categories, abolish categories, and that will prevent hierarchy and that will prevent oppression. And so maybe that's what the questioner has in mind. Like, um, is that what's happening with gender categories? Is there a deliberate attempt to, so to speak, explode them, demolish them, render them meaningless 
um, in an attempt to uh, produce a sort of flat egalitarian society where there's no hierarchies, no oppression, and we can all finally be free to do whatever we want all the time. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of the of Karl Marx's vision of utopia. Um, but anyway, if that's the question, got, I, I guess you're just asking, are people doing this intentionally? I don't know. Um, I guess you'd have to ask a social psychologist or a sociologist and try to figure out what's going on in people's heads. As a philosopher, I just kind of think about the ideas and not so much what people's motivations are. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been a lot of fun. And is, is there anything from the actual documentary itself that you wanted to talk about that we haven't talked about? We have like another two minutes. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. What, yeah, what about fair you? Enough. Do you want to say anything else? No. Um, I, I, what I, before we went live, I was kind of saying that I had uh, the idea that I had envisioned in my head was kind of we would just go through each interview, but I like what we did better just kind of talking sort of topically over the whole thing. So I, I thought it was, I thought it was very sufficient. I hope it was a useful supplement to people who are entering this debate yes. um, from the documentary. Yes, exactly. So, okay. Uh, yeah. If you'd like to learn more about Thomas Bogardus, just search for him. You can search for him on YouTube. He's got a bunch of different things that he's working on. I've also got links to his work in the description of this video, but thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for hanging out with this movie review. Let me do this before, before I say goodbye is if you would like to see more movie reviews like this, let me know in the comments because I've done one other movie review with Randall Rouser. We reviewed God's Not Dead. And that was actually a couple of years ago at this point. But if you would like to see more Christian reviews like this from movies, then let me know. I would love to hear your feedback if you'd like to see more. Or if you hated this, you don't want to see any more of it, also let me know. But thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out. And I'll see you guys in the next Capturing Christianity video very soon. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, 